Um, now we've heard from all the players except the council. Um, so our next speaker is, is representing the Parramatta City Council. It's Matt Fisher. Uh, Matt has worked in sustainability and energy efficiency policy for more than 10 years. He completed a master's in building sustainability at UNSW in 2001 and a degree in architecture in 1994. As an architect, he designed sustainably progressive buildings. He currently is the environmental up agreement upgrade coordinator for the Parramatta City Council. So please join with me in welcoming Matt. Thank you, Darren. So, so my job today is to present uh, environmental upgrade agreements from a council perspective. Um, and, and it's been a great thing that we've achieved the first one in New South Wales and it's been a long road. So there's a few things I'd like to say. From a council's perspective, there were three things I guess we really did is we first initially considered uh, the benefit of EUAs to our LGA. We also looked at uh, the systems that would be required for that. Um, and then how we would roll out that program. So Parramatta, I think, probably has some similarities with the City of Adelaide. Um, the EUAs are for all commercial building types. I'm going to talk about office buildings, which we focused on mainly. We've got a range of, um, of large buildings. We're a significant city. We're the fifth largest city in Australia. Uh, it's home to 34% of Sydney's workforce, so there's a large amount of office space. Uh, and it's actually a fast growing economy. It's the second fastest growing economy uh, in Australia. We've attracted uh, quite a large number of corporate clients. The Western Sydney region is home to more than 20% of uh, Australia's top 500 companies. And similar to Adelaide, we have a large component of uh, governments. They're actually a very significant tenant with over 25% of all office space and Parramatta being government tenanted. So the first section is, is why do EUAs offer a great deal of potential for, for local councils and how it has applied to, to Parramatta. So although we do have a lot of new buildings, um, we also have a lot of older building stock, uh, which is like most cities. The majority of our stock was built in the 1980s, the boom of the 80s. And that's an issue of these buildings now becoming 20 and 30 years old. So we did some initial research uh, around the, these sections of buildings we have. 49% uh, of buildings are in that uh, segment, so it's nearly half of the buildings are between 20 and 30 years old. And these buildings, which uh, typically have ageing plant uh, in terms of their air conditioning and cooling plant nearing the end of their life, uh, the lifts uh, and lighting, and a lot of them have had many years of underinvestment, uh, starting to see uh, levels of tenancy uh, degrading, um, and there's work to be done. So we focused on uh, much in the same way that the work that you've done in Adelaide of estimating the benefits uh, for our LGA in terms of the economic benefits, uh, environmental benefits that could be stimulated. We looked at the, uh, the sectorial breakdown of the age of these buildings, we estimated the likely technologies that would be in these buildings and the age of them. Uh, and then we um, estimated the types of technologies and upgrades that we put into those buildings and the costs that would occur. So we had, in a similar way, we had an uh, investment potential in the Parramatta LGA of $150 million. There was uh, the potential for $26 million of reduced outgoing costs for building owners. 148 jobs and significant savings in terms of CO2 emissions in water. That's over an eight year program of, uh, to 2020 of an EUA program, so we looked at it through the life of the program. So going back to the building stock, one, one other um, initial part of our research that we did, which I, I don't think has been brought up yet, with building stock, a large amount of it built in the 80s, we're seeing a uh, potential for a large amount of building growth. We've got about 960,000 square metres of building stock in Parramatta currently, uh, and they're looking at developing an additional 300,000, so an extra 30%. So we often focus on our cities thinking, well, we're developing all these new buildings. Uh, our cities are becoming newer. But it's actually the opposite. Although in 10 years' time all these new buildings will occur, the existing buildings will now be 10 years older. So actually seeing, even with these new buildings, 
that 54% of buildings um, in 2022 would be older than 20 uh, years. And in fact, 37% uh, would be 30 to 40 years old, which are virtually nearing the end of their life. So tackling these existing buildings is a very important part of um, cities uh, that potentially could stagnate without intervention. So that's a very important impetus which we looked at. We're starting to see some buildings in pre-EUA that are, are uh, tackling these issues. This is a building in Parramatta, it's 100 George Street, it was built in 1982, it's quite a typical type of building. Um, Pebble Creek facade, uh, plant is old and breaking down. Uh, poor tenancy levels, I think they had something like 40% of the building untenanted, poor rental returns and loss of competitiveness in the market. That had an upgrade which was finished uh, last year. Uh, it was a $6 million upgrade, uh, including uh, recladding, $2 million of HVAC and BMS and lifts. This had a, a corner tenant, a key tenant, which uh, wanted these environmental upgrades or wanted environmental uh, performance improved, uh, which led to that being considered by the building owner. So it may not necessarily have been their initial impetus in the way that they upgraded that building. But upon realising that and deciding that investment pathway, the owner was uh, then realised that the, those investments future-proof their asset in terms of the potential for the market um, over the next 10 years or 20 years of the life of that asset uh, that may change towards requiring increased performance. So that's a building that went from one stars to four stars and equally the economic uh, um, issues around that improved in line with the uh, the investment. So we're seeing a six million dollar increase in value, uh, twenty percent increases of rental returns, and uh, a large reduction in energy use, uh, which was potentially saved on the tenants. So for local councils. Um, I'll go back over that. Um, there is a real potential to stimulate uh, the upgrading of existing building stock. Uh, there are real environmental and economic outcomes which are uh, important for local government. Some in local governments have probably a, a higher um, interest in environmental versus economic benefits, but they're definitely both through there. Um, and it stimulates the uh, improvement in their building centres. So I'm going to quickly cover the, uh, the processes that we developed, uh, funded by OEH. Uh, we were given um, some money to develop our systems and as we discussed the, the funding required just to support council to develop the systems were, was critical. There's quite a large amount of in engagement required both from the upper levels of, C of council and CEO to endorse that but uh, a very real part for councils uh, probably interesting to uh, City of Adelaide is, is it does involve a range of departments within council to work together. Uh, although they're doing different jobs, everyone needs to understand their roles. So we had uh, the systems development put in place. We had a large amount of training and procedure manuals which developed quite simple and robust uh, systems. I won't cover this in too much detail, but basically from the legislation we mapped all the required processes that were, were required. Um, and that uh, took about three months, but that work's largely been done in New South Wales and also in the city of Melbourne. So there's, there's a lot that could be shared with, uh, with Adelaide. <laughs> so after developing systems, we hit the ground running. We, we got our systems in place, we got it approved by council. And uh, our next step was to, to consult with people and engage with the market and we were quite excited being able to offer these services and uh, thought that the market would come to us uh, with some education and engagement. So we did a range of education and marketing sessions. We contacted all the large property groups and building owners. We did some data analysis, thinking also that um, HVAC and lighting systems would be the big wins. So we went out into the marketplace. But nine months later, we were asking, well, why haven't we found any EUAs yet? Nine months isn't a very long time, but progressively to go out there and pound the pavement and talk to people and educate people, um, we were starting to wonder you know, what was required. And we found that we needed to provide more and more detail. And I guess some of the, the facts and the figures which came out of um, Ashley's uh, um, speech 
really goes into what building owners are requiring. And I think as they get more of that information, they'll start to understand how it might benefit them and their asset. So it is, it's a large industry transformation. And I think there is a large amount of education required and it's good to see that Adelaide's doing this level of engagement with the property sector early because it is a new uh, type of mechanism, but there are obviously benefits. So build examples will help. Um, I think the, the, the role of third parties uh, which give advice to building owners is important. So they're the types of property companies and uh, accountants and, uh, and so forth. So they also need to be educated. And I think we're reaching a tipping point um, in that in New South Wales after those nine months. So the example 10 Valentine Avenue, I think we've had quite a lot talked about it. It was a lighting upgrade for a full 16,000 square metre building. Uh, it's had a very good environmental benefit with a 65% energy reduction. SPA and uh, Australian Unity, who were the two parties, worked very, very well together. Uh, and I think that's been very useful for this initial uh, EUA in New South Wales, is to have such a strong team to work with. Uh, both SPA and, and Australian Unity receives benefits from that. Um, and I think that point about the engagement of the tenant and the building owner both said that um, you can often be an adversarial relationship that exists with a building owner and the tenant as they renegotiate leases on an ongoing basis. Uh, and this really got them to understand uh, a mutual relationship, which I think they're going to get carried forward with. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. That's the Council's perspective.